are we are we uh, are we rolling? Okay, I was just talking about. Uh, I thought I'd just start by talking about violence. That's, that's what we were talking—a portrayal of violence. And um, this was something I learned when I read uh, *Shogun*, James Clavell's novel. Uh, there's, of course, you can't write about uh, Japan without writing about people getting chopped up by samurai and, and all kinds of good stuff like that, blown up by ninja, and. I noticed that he never went into any of the gory details. Uh, he simply says that the, the sword came down, the head came off, and, uh, and then he goes right on with the scene, whatever else is happening. He doesn't dwell on the blood flowing and the blood on the sword, and the sword have to be wiped off. And so <coughs> that's sort of one thing I've tried, in other words, I've tried to avoid in my books with sort of what I would call the pornography of violence where you, when you describe some a violent action, you really get into it, you, talk, you really try to get the reader to practically throw up or whatever, or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> at some, uh, which, uh, which some writers do. So, did, do, do people have anything like to ask? Or do you want me to, um... Just a, a quick comment, you know, sure. the Illuminatus is now, uh, it's official, it's a college course at Oberlin. It's called no uh, it's, it's experimental college, but it's it's called uh, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> and uh -huh. the, the text is the Illuminatus, which they'll read for the whole semester. Hmm. Oh, that's hey, fantastic! Well, Did you know that? No, that's Oberlin in college Ohio here, here, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very it's a very high. I mean, it's a, considered to be a very top. Where is this? Liberal, yeah. small liberal arts college. Where is it? In Oberlin. Oberlin is uh, near Cleveland. Yeah, other side of Cleveland from here. It seems to me I knew somebody who taught there uh, back in the early 60s. You know, it's, uh, uh, I have been told, I don't know if this is, I can't, I can't know if this is true, and Bob Wilson, I think, can't know if it's true either, that we have very similar sounding voices. I know I don't sound anything like him to me in my own ears, you know, but that's what people say, and I was just thinking that on this tape, people probably, if that, if that is true, people won't know which of us is talking. <laughs> but we think we should say for the record that uh, this is Bob Shea talking and uh, Bob Wilson is sitting right across from me and sometimes if you hear a voice that sounds like me but says something that I wouldn't say <laughs> but those who, those who know me well would, would know I wouldn't say it's probably Bob Wilson all Bobs in any case yeah. and we have the great, uh, the great smiling Bob head behind us here I wonder if we should, uh, should we be happy or not about that, that uh, Illuminatus has made it into the canon. I like it. You like the canon or you like Illuminatus? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I like the idea that there's at least one college is teaching it. I heard of another that was teaching it several years ago, but that was very far out, experimental, and uh, unaccredited. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that there have been, it has been used as a, an, um, there was a, a contemporary novel course at Durham uh, taught by a woman named Bernadette Bosky, uh, who was a um, uh, who was an assistant teacher at uh, Duke. At, I'm sorry, at Duke, Duke University, and uh, she used it as one as one of a number of of, of books. So it has a, it has a, a been taught, but not you know not as the, not as the central book. Shall I start with I was born? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. In your, yeah. in your historical mm -hmm. novels, how much historical research do you do before you even, quote, get started? Or, or, do you, or are you started as you're doing the research? Uh, I usually, well, I, I, wouldn't, uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't really be inspired to write about a particular period unless I already had some notion. <coughs> that it was, uh, I, I knew enough about it to know that it was a kind of an interesting period of history and I'd like to do something about it. Um, so normally I, uh, I already have a little stuff that I know about. For instance, uh, the first historical novel I did was Shike, which was set in medieval Japan. And I had kind of gotten interested in Asian history as a, uh, as a small boy, I guess when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And um, we had a set of volumes of world history in my house that my father had acquired. And I remember reading and rereading and rereading the histories of Japan and China. For some reason, 
they were more interesting to me than some of the, the some of the histories of some of the other countries. So there was that kind of, and that, that, that interest always kind of stayed with me. So there's kind of a, a sort of global interest in the background, and then um, I usually uh, uh, have a couple of books around a house that I might consult. At some point, I have to have a, and I basically, an, you need an idea for a story. Uh, I uh, one of, the, with all things are lights. My second novel, uh, I had th the idea wasn't really much of an idea. The idea was just, gee, the 13th century in Europe was an interesting time. I'd like to write a book about the 13th century in Europe. But then I needed characters, I needed people with a problem and so on. And, and uh, so I had to do, and I remember doing quite a bit of research into things going on in the 13th century before I finally settled on a particular set of events that I thought I could uh, wrap my fictitious characters around. So, uh, there's, but um, I generally start writing without having done a whole lot of research. I, I just plunge right in and uh, try to uh, uh, try to find out what I need to know as I go along, or, or correct myself later on if I'm if I'm wrong about something. I was I was thinking. Uh, I have a general objection to the, to the uh, gory violence that's so popular these days, and yet I make exceptions, and I try to figure out why I make exceptions. Mm -hmm. It depends on my belief in the integrity of the director. Like Bonnie and Clyde seems like a great film to me, in spite of all the blood at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And same with Silence of the Lambs. And so there's something very mysterious at work there. If, if I really believe in the, in the, in the uh, ideas and the emotions and the truth of the uh, artistic vision, uh, it can be as gruesome as uh, Odysseus uh, blinding uh, Polyphemus after Polyphemus has devoured his half of his crew and then vomited them up again. And that's pretty, that's pretty gross. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's, you know. I mean, I believe in Homer, and uh, I believe in Arthur Penn uh, as a director. And uh, whatever the, uh, as soon as I remember the name of the guy who directed Silence of the Lambs, Dumbly, Dumbly, those. Well, I think he, uh, yeah, yes, uh, this, that movie has resonance and power. So I don't regard it as uh, part of the sickness of our culture the way I regard an awful lot of these slasher movies. I can't think of uh, I can't think of a specific movie offhand, but there's sort of a type of B-type movie where there's a lot of shooting, people get blown away, and <clears throat> you can just kind of see that the director is reveling in the fact that he can have these little exploding things with make blood fly out of, uh, of somebody's body or else he can have um, a, a decapitated person or something like that and zoom in on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I'm not talking about the, while well, the, 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 the uh, movies that are deliberately uh, exploitative of horror, like the Friday the 13th and, and uh, the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street kind of movies, because you know what you're getting when you go into one of those. But it's, 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 a, it's a sort of a kind of middle thing where the director isn't all that good and the story isn't all that good. <laughs> <laughs> You're just awash with blood, you know, from uh, this. <clears throat> then there's borderline movies. Like, I, I think um, uh, I think one of the best gangster movies I've seen this year is Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. And um, there are times when I feel like they're, they're really exploiting... Uh, <laughs> They're really pushing my buttons. Some of the, some of the violence in that is just, I mean, it's it's accurate though. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that that, that went on. But they really kind of uh, the movie really kind of dwells on it. Uh, it really grosses you out. Um, yeah, it has so it's kind of a borderline for me. It's it, kind of a it borderline. It has an excellent movie. depiction of uh, of uh, the sensation of being on way too much cocaine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the editing. job of yeah. showing the kind of jerks people become. <laughs> that whole, uh, yeah, that whole last part where he's, where he's doing cocaine is, 
<coughs> the I think it's the editing of the movie. They sort of the, it, there's there's this, the they each each little piece is sort of speeded up and it's very choppy and and uh, and you go you go from situation to situation very fast and and it all gives you that feeling of being. Somebody asked him Larry about cocaine once, and he said some people are just born loud, obnoxious assholes. Mm -hmm. Others have to discover cocaine. To get <laughs> well, I started. Uh, let's see. I started writing. I, di I didn't really start start out to be a writer. I started out to be a comic strip. Uh, I wanted to create a comic strip. Uh, when I was, uh, I, I really loved. Uh, but I, you know, I never knew that about Bob. Bob was talking about the fact that he made model dinosaurs. And I made model dinosaurs too. I also did uh, comic books. And comic books, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I did a. Uh, <laughs> all my comic books were imitation Buck Rogers comic books. I was really, I was, I was. Uh, I was born in 1933, and I think practically the first thing I learned to read by the uh, outside of the uh, grammar school Dick and Jane book that we had was uh, was uh, Buck Rogers. I, I have this vivid memory of, of the early Buck Rogers, uh, which appeared in New York City in the Saturday New York Journal American, and it was a uh, it was a, a full page. They used to. That's the terrible thing about comic strips. They they've shrunk. Over the, now, there's no such thing as a as a whole page of a newspaper devoted to a single color comic strip, and those things were really works of art. <coughs> so I uh, I started out doing those things, and I would um, when I was about 11 years old, I was doing a comic strip on a small sheet of paper and using carbon paper to make to make uh, multiple copies mm -hmm. of it and then going around from door to door in the apartment house where I lived selling this for a penny a copy and I think even you know at child even at child labor rates uh, <laughs> they would really get anybody who bought one of my comic strips they were hand colored uh, <laughs> with crayons and I used both sides of the paper too so uh, they were getting an awful lot for their penny <laughs> anybody who bought it but it's still pretty hard to sell and <laughs> pretty hard to get people interested um, and then I guess uh, <clears throat> I made the terrible mistake of thinking that writing is easier than being a commercial artist uh, or a cartoonist because you don't need any formal training to be a writer, whereas if you want to be a... <laughs> uh, I was still kind of torn when I was in college. In fact, I really didn't know what I wanted to be until, until my analyst told me uh, when I was about 40 um, that, I, that what I had been all my life was a writer. And <clears throat> I should probably, uh, it was probably too late to change careers at this point, and uh, so I should probably continue doing that. But uh, I uh, anyway, I got this. I, I, I went to the cart to a school in New York City called Cartoonists and Illustrators School, and I did that for a semester. And I guess it just at the college was when I discovered that you didn't really have to work your ass off to get people to approve of you, which is kind of something that I was raised to believe. <laughs> and, uh, and I began to slack. I, be I discovered slack. <laughs> <laughs> Even before Bob? Yes. Oh, well, you know, I mean, all these revelations go back. Uh, I was thinking, I, you know, I was thinking when that panel was on that uh, every, every religion, no matter how recently it was started, actually goes back, goes back to the very, the very beginning of creation. Uh, I have a, a, a friend who was an Episcopalian who was being... Um, who was taking religious instruction, and the priest, the Episcopal priest who was teaching the class, said, uh, who, and children, who was the founder of our religion? And of course, they all said, Henry VIII. And he said, no, no, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, I, so I went to this cartoonist and illustrated school. I discovered Slack, and I decided to, uh, I decided to miss classes, and uh, pretty soon I wasn't going. I was doing that as kind of a night thing, 
and during the day I was going going to the to a regular college and uh, writing just sort of started to seem easier. Uh, once I learned how to touch type, everything else was downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Something I'd, I'd like to hear your experiences with Buddhism, how that affected you from, you know, before you studied it and after. What difference it made? Well, I got it, yeah, I first got interested in Buddhism with, um, and this was, well, yeah, 1959. And I think that's when uh, Buddhism started to become kind of popular in the United States. There had been various movements before that, but 1959. Uh, Ray Bradbury, I think I mentioned, if you were there yesterday, I mentioned yeah. that uh, he wrote an article in the Writer magazine called Zen and the Art of Writing. And let's see, I was in graduate school at that time. I had been in the Army and I got out of the Army and I was in graduate school and I guess I'd heard a little bit about Zen and Buddhism before that, but uh, I was kind of struggling with the idea of, of trying to uh, write fiction and to be prolific enough to maybe make a living doing this. I had decided that graduate school, I was studying English literature in graduate school, and I had decided that this was kind of a great bore and I didn't want to, um, and I think that was probably me, because the study of English literature is not intrinsically boring. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that was my reaction to it or to the way it was taught there. and. It was a great revelation to me because he came up with this work, relax, don't think kind of formulation. And uh, he mentioned Eugen Herigl's, uh The Art, uh, Zen and the Art of Archery. And so I read that. And the idea that I got from both of these things was that um, a lot of my problems with writing, which tend to, my problems with writing tend to be that I was crushed every time I got a rejection. And all the time that I was uh, that I was in this graduate school, this is after I got out of the army. I was really pretty seriously trying to sell stories to magazines, and I was doing about a story a week, uh, short stories. And I had three different markets that I was general markets that I was writing for. I was trying to write stories for what we called euphemistically the slick men's magazines which meant girly magazines like Playboy and uh, Playboy and then all the way down to magazines called things like Nugget and High Life. <laughs> and and uh, So I was trying to write for that market. Then I was trying to write science fiction. And I also was trying to write literary stories for literary magazines and sending them off to places like the Kenyan Review and the Sawani Review. And, Sometimes I'd start, I'd have, I had my list, you know, you start at the top of your list, right. and this is the best paying market, <laughs> so you send it there first. And so like all my men's magazine stories went to Playboy. And uh, I remember I, 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 another student, graduate student and I collaborated on a story for Playboy, which we called Scarlet Panties. <laughs> and, and, uh, it was, uh, it was not successful. It did not succeed. But uh, that's, that's we put a lot. Bad. We put a lot of work into it. Well, that's we the didn't understand that Playboy. The whole thing was, in order to write really write for Playboy, you had to know what the heck they were they were into that month. Yeah. Which meant <laughs> which meant you actually had to be there in Chicago and drinking and talking with right. the editorial staff because they always had a different idea of what they were doing. And I think the times that I, the time that I was writing, I thought, well, what they want is, uh, they want pornography, kind of classy pornography with long sentences. <laughs> and I remember my, my collaborator said, ellipses. And I said, what? And he said, ellipses, if you study Playboy carefully, you will discover that all the articles in Playboy and all of the editorial writing and everything else is full of ellipses. So we have to write an elliptical style. <laughs> <laughs> So we wrote this elliptical pornographic story called Scarlet Panties, which went nowhere. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's the benefit of collaboration. When it fails, you can always blame the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was definitely his fault. He, w he, went on to be a he went on to become a performance artist. <laughs> that was the last I heard of him. He was living in New York City, and he was a performance artist. So we, b we both escaped, anyway, from academia. Um, I'm, I haven't forgotten your question. Uh, Everybody so else has. <laughs> <laughs> Buddhism. Oh, Buddhism. Buddhism. Yes, Buddhism. Yes. 
So I. Um, no, I'm got a scarlet panties. Uh, <laughs> you just can't get away from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I lost track of Buddha. Actually, actually, <laughs> Bob, that was the high point of my literary career. Uh, <laughs> but uh, after that, I uh, um, well, during that time that I was writing these, that I was writing these stories, uh, every time I would get, uh, I, I had the, I had the method down pretty good. You got to write, you got to send it out, you got to keep sending it out until somebody buys it. But my problem was a certain just basic insecurity in my character that would not allow me to, I was just simply not optimistic enough um, to do that. And uh, I have friends, you know, who are even much worse at this than I am. But, but uh, I mean, I would bounce back, but I, I had one friend who, who wrote <laughs> poems for years and years and years, and she finally submitted them all to Poetry Magazine. And they turned him down, and you know, not not for any, uh, not because they said they were bad poems or anything, but she's been so crushed by that that she hasn't contributed and has sub submitted anything to any magazine since then. Well, you haven't gotten back so, to Buddhism yet. Oh, well, this is all about Buddhism. When you meet scarlet <laughs> panties on the road, kill them. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, like the main, the the, uh, the main, one of the main uh. symbols. No, I don't know if it's a main symbol. But in Japan, they have these dolls, which are called Daruma dolls. And Daruma is, is the Japanese name for Bodhidharma. And Bodhidharma is kind of the founder of uh, the patriarch of, of Zen Buddhism, the, the, uh, the uh, Indian monk who, went, who came from India to China and introduced. And his, his ideas then, when they got together with uh, Taoism in China, kind of led to uh, what we know as Zen Buddhism. And these Daruma dolls always, uh, they're, 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 they have a, they're weighted and they have a rounded bottom. And the way you know Bodhidharma is that, or Daruma, is that he has huge eyes, great big eyes that just fix you. And the reason he has those eyes is because when he was meditating, he, he found that he had a tendency to fall asleep. And so he cut off his eyelids. And in order to keep his eyes open, and he threw them on the ground, and from his eyelids sprang the tea plant, which uh, ever since then Zen monks have used to uh, to keep themselves awake when they're trying to meditate. Um, do you all believe that? <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, the Daruma doll. Um, has this rounded bottom, and when you push it over, of course, it bounces back right away. And this then is a this is a is a kind of a a, a, a Zen principle. Uh, you get pushed over, you bounce back. You know, it's no problem. Nothing is a problem really. Nothing not, nothing finally destroys you. Nothing finally crushes you. You can't be crushed. Uh, because you uh, because you as you don't exist really. You know. Um, at any rate, Ray Bradbury, I think, knew only that much more about Zen than I did when he wrote that article. But uh, he wrote it so beautifully, and it was so exciting that. Uh, and I said, I, I, what I saw was that my problem, as I said, was that every time I got a rejection slip, every time I got an article back, I thought, God, I'm just no, I'm just no good. I don't know how to write, and I've got to go back to square one and figure and learn how to write short stories uh, because obviously I'm doing something wrong. Well, I wasn't doing anything wrong, it's just that it takes a long time. A lot of people are sending in stories, and it takes a long time to get to, get to the point where people are buying your material regularly. And the more you produce and the more you don't worry about uh, how you're doing and what you're doing, and are you using the right method, and is there, is your, how's your story structure, and all that kind of stuff, the more you don't worry about that kind of stuff and just keep cranking it out repetitiously week after week, um, the sooner probably you will succeed as a writer. And this was the message I got from Zen and the Art of Writing. Uh, the way Bradbury put it was work, be prolific, be productive, uh, quantity, uh, in a sufficient quantity will lead to quality. Um, <coughs> relax, um, meaning that when you when you when you when you're in the habit of working and you're not self-critical and you don't have that inner tension, that is, I mean, I know that for me this is really the thing that kind of stops me, that that, that always slows me down when I'm writing. When I start, when I become, uh, I come up with a sentence and I think, oh, that's a shitty sentence. Um, mm -hmm. 
boy, you know, oh, that's a cliche. I can't write that. Now let me see. How can I recast it? And I'm, I sit there and I stare at the screen. And then after a little while, I forget what I was thinking about. And then I start looking out the window. And then after about 10 minutes of that, uh, I mean, this goes on today, but back in, back in 1959, it was yellow paper uh, <laughs> and a little portable typewriter. Uh, looking out the window and, uh, God, I can't, I'm not writing anything here, and I'm, I'm, this is just not a good day. And, and uh, so the relaxation involved is getting away from that kind of inner tension that inhibits one's flow of thought and creativity and just going with it. And the don't think part, as I interpreted it, meant you can't not, you can't write, you have to think when you're writing. I mean, that's basically what writing would what writing is all about is, is, is thinking and then putting the thoughts on paper in some form. Uh, so I, uh, I discovered, uh, I, the, so what I, th what I decided he meant was don't, be, don't think critically. Don't, don't, don't second, in other words, don't second guess yourself. So um, I then started reading, I, started, I read uh, uh, whatever books by Alan Watts were available at the time, and the more, and the more I read, the more I was attracted to this. And I read uh, some Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, uh, Eugen Harrigal, and uh, there wasn't much more that was around, I think, uh, at that time. And it didn't really, I, I can't say it really took, I was attracted to it, but I didn't really know that, what, what I could do with that. Uh, and it was a, it, it, so that was the beginning, but it was a long process. For one thing, at the time, it was, uh, until I was, um, was in my, camel? But the, try, was it its nose? Was it a camel's nose? It looked like a camel. Uh-huh. Well, don't let any more than, you know, don't let the nose in and the rest of the camel will, will follow. <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> I was a practicing Orthodox Catholic, and a real when I when I buy into a, a belief system, I really seem to buy into it a hundred percent. And uh, so at that time, that's what I that's what I, I, I believed in. So I really couldn't kind of uh, reconcile that with Buddhism, you know. So re Buddhism had to be sort of an academic pursuit. It couldn't uh, I couldn't allow myself to become. Other other Catholics did not have this kind of problem, like mm -hmm. Thomas Merton, for example, had, had uh, Dom Aylred Graham, and people like that, you know, seem to find. And the nice thing about Zen is that it it, it is pretty adaptable. Uh, it allows you to. Uh, it, it it can be. Uh, it's it's it, Buddhism and and particularly Zen are so undogmatic that they uh, they allow themselves to be transferred pretty easily, and you you can hold other philosophical. You can have other philosophical beliefs and so on. Of course, it raises some, uh, with Zen, that uh, ra raises some question about the, the value and validity of being attached to various other dogmas or uh, teachings or moral codes or what have you. But um, I think the thing that attracted the, the thing that attracted me to it was that that um, you just go. You just do. You just act. You do it. You don't have. You don't. And, and uh, it was the whole idea of getting away from being self-critical and ratiocination and and all of those things that, if you're at all intellectual, if you have the the curse of the open mind, which uh, which I know I do. I mean, I'm the kind of guy if somebody comes in and robs my apartment, I think now I wonder why he did that. Uh, I wonder what his problem was that he needed money. <laughs> you know that he had to take all my stuff. And, and uh, uh, I always, I always have this problem psyching myself up to get mad and do something about, you know. So, um, so naturally, then, then the, the result is that I admire people who are people of immediate and decisive action. Uh, people like, like the samurai. And uh, when I, when I read about the samurai, and so many uh, of, the, of the samurai, once when Zen came to Japan. It's very hard, and, and I, I still really don't feel like I haven't figured out um, how a religion that teaches nonviolence and, and uh, ahimsa, I think was the original word, harmlessness, could be the favorite religion for so many of the Japanese samurai, uh, except that 
conceivably it was a matter of a code that is you know you don't go around chopping just anybody's head off but uh, you re if you're really a good uh, warrior you restrict yourself to uh, practicing and competing with other warriors um, one of my favorite movies is if, uh, have you all seen the samurai trilogy uh, anybody seen that uh, it's it's um, it stars uh, Toshiro Mifune as probably the greatest Japanese swordsman, um, a man named Miyamoto Musashi, and Musashi was fascinating because he was a uh, he was a sort of Leonardo da Vinci of samurai. He wrote poetry, he wrote philosophy, he was a sculptor, he was a painter, and he was also head and shoulders above uh, any other uh, any other samurai of his time and this was a time after the Tokugawa took over in Japan and the samurai no longer really had much of a function because the entire country had been pacified by the Tokugawa shogunate and that was the period when Japan was isolated from about 1600 down to eight of the 1850s when the United States uh, <laughs> are acted out its karma, ha ha having, having by that time destroyed the Indians, you know, it was our turn, <laughs> and what <laughs> it was our karmic destiny to open up Japan, to, to encourage Japan to come out into the world and participate in the, in the 19th and 20th century world. <laughs> and uh, we're still paying the price for that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but... Uh, um, Musashi, uh, just he was he was he was so good. This guy that he he there's one scene where he he um, he's having um, he's in an inn and he's eating rice and uh, there are flies in the rice or there are flies flying around the rice and um, these uh, low life types are creeping up on him because they don't know who he is but they figure they're going to beat him up and take his money. And he's sitting there with chopsticks eating the rice, and then these flies start bothering him. So he starts plucking the flies right out of the air with the chopsticks. <laughs> and all those, all those people who were going to attack him creep away again. But I guess the reason why I mention this is that throughout, um, throughout the three movies, there is another, he, while well, he is kind of establishing his reputation as the greatest swordsman in Japan, and of course he's taught by a monk, he, he learns everything. He's not taught how to fight by a monk, but his whole philosophy comes from this monk, and, and the monk starts his teaching by trapping Musashi and, and hauling him up uh, with a rope around his waist, hauling him up to the top of a tree. And, and just leaving him dangling there for, for a couple of days until he finally promises. Musashi at this point is kind of a wild man and the monk sort of tames him and says, all right, if I let you down and you listen to what I have to say, then I'll feed you and, and so on. So um, this other fellow, Sasaki, is like the second, well, they don't know, we don't know it at this point. One of these guys is the greatest swordsman of, of all time. And um, so samurai simply wandered around the country competing with one another because there wasn't anything else for them to do. Um, and so when finally when, um, when Musashi and Sasaki, you know that, that, that by the third, the, the third movie, these movies, you can watch them all in one night, uh, and I have, they're all, each one is about 90 minutes long. First one is about his early life, and the second one is sort of the middle stages when he gets to be, when he builds his reputation. And the third one, they, he, he and his rival meet on this island, and it's under the sponsorship of a local daimyo or, or, or lord, landlord, and they fight. And the fight lasts about 10 seconds. And, at the, and Sasaki is standing there smiling when it's all over, and then he just keels over because something that happens so fast that you can't even see it has happened and and Sasaki is defeated and Musashi gets into this boat he's rowed across by this um, by this old uh, naturally a philosophical old boatman you know and and he's going back to this Toshiro Mifune is such a wonderful actor and he's just sitting in the boat weeping his head off sobbing just crying his head off because he's killed this other guy and so uh, so there is some kind of connection between 
uh, not only does not only Buddhism teach uh, or Zen teach the idea of none of, of, of not getting in between not allowing thought to get in the way of action but um, as I say, the samurai somehow, they, they managed to reconcile the, uh, the fact that uh, what they did was go around killing people with, uh, with their Buddhism, and, and, it, and it somehow worked together. Um, so the, the thing that, th this is the thing that attracted me, but it was, uh, it was only later, then, then I went through, uh, by the 60s I had started, I, I had started a kind of break, uh, my own kind of philosophical break with the Catholic Church. And I don't know if any of you rem ever remember Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen, who was mm -hmm. the, uh, okay. And well, also him and Bella Lugosi at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, Monsignor Sheen had, had certain signs about him. One was that his eyebrows grew straight across mm -hmm. like this. But um, I remember we used to, my, my mother used to put him on religiously every Sunday night. And this is this is radio I'm talking about. I guess he, he, he by the time he was Bishop Sheen, he became a star of TV, of religious TV. He was an early televangelist, and uh, and to his great credit, I think before his uh, his death, he was a, a very outspoken opponent of the Vietnam War, and I think since he generally tended to be a pretty orthodox guy. If I'm going to talk about it, I should mention the fact that he, his, uh, whatever his, do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, how he, he, he became, um, he became a kind of a major anti-war figure. Um, but he was pretty orthodox. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me when I was, a, when I was listening to him sort of perforce as a kid was, no Catholic has ever left the Catholic Church because of philosophical differences. It's always because they can't live up to the moral code of the church. And this is particularly true in the area of sex. I don't know if he said <laughs> sex right out there in the radio, but it was, he was talking about divorce, you know, the fact that Catholics can't remarry if they get a divorce, and, and um, birth control, and those, those, those issues. And that's true, and that, I, that's why I left the Catholic Church, because I could no longer live up to its moral code. <laughs> and I thought he's right, but he thought there was something reprehensible about that. I mean, his point was that you really it shows you're really a person of poor character, and uh, you're really just a bad person, and that's that's why you leave the church, not because you you've reasoned your way out of it. So I started off with reasoning that a lot of the the, the things that I was doing, I had I had married, and my marriage ended in divorce, and uh, uh, it was a um, regular Catholic marriage and everything else, and, and it lasted just a very short time, and it was a big mistake for both of us. And I thought, then, I'm going to have to, um, if I want to stay a good Catholic, I am going to have to spend the rest of my life celibate. I hadn't really been celibate up to that point. <laughs> I mean, but, but I thought, well, well, anyway, I'm not going to be able to get married again, or if I do get married, it's not going to be the real thing. I mean, uh, God really isn't going to approve of it. So, I thought, that's crazy. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. And then I was fortunate enough to meet uh, a, a woman um, with whom I began an affair uh, shortly after my marriage uh, broke up. And I thought, gee, this is, this is all, according to the church, this is wrong. This is bad. Uh, this, this, uh, this poor woman here is an adulteress. And I'm dragging her into this whole thing. So I thought, well, that's crazy, too. What we're doing is very good. I cannot feel bad about this. I cannot feel guilty. I can't feel wrong about it. Oh, and of course, we were practicing birth control. I mean, this lady and I were practicing birth control because <laughs> so we had the, the additional sin. So I began, I began well, is that, is that, oh, should, should I be, you know, siring children here in this, in this convoluted situation? So that basically is where that, that, that led to my, to my breaking with the church. And, and um, one of the things that I found myself turning to at that point was turning back to my old interest in Buddhism and starting to read about it again and starting to, in fact, uh, and, and it was, that was what I'm talking about now. This was um, 1965, 66, which was really the beginning of the era, the decade that we call the 60s, 
as the, the 60s didn't begin in 1960. Uh, but, well, some of the threads began there, but it really kind of got going around 1966, I would say. And, uh, and one of the big things was that uh, Zen people started popping up all over the place. And um, uh, I didn't actually get the opportunity to uh, meet and work with any Zen teachers then, but uh, the literature expanded tremendously. And, and um, Alan Watts was writing a lot of stuff at that time. It was very influential articles and books and so on. And I, I have to, Zen, Zen, Orthodox Zen people have a tendency to, to put down Alan Watts, which I think is very unfortunate. I think that uh, they do it on the grounds, you know, you, people say, well, he never really had a Satori, you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that in his own way, he was, uh, I met him a couple of times, so I'm not talking just from, um, I'm not talking just from um, what I think about him based on his books. Uh, I think that he was, um, I think that he was in his way a very illuminated person and that um, he certainly was able to take very, very ideas, philosophical ideas that are very, very difficult for people trained in Western thinking to understand and make them understandable and sometimes only momentarily. I mean, you would read a, a book by Alan Watts, and for about an hour afterwards, you would go around thinking you finally got it, you know, <laughs> and then it would kind of fade out again. And and sometimes, even if you reread the book, it wouldn't it wouldn't be enough. But anyway, it kind of gave you it kind of gave you the idea that there was something else out there. There was another way of looking at things. And I really think uh, I I think I I keep all of his books on my shelf now, and I refer to them from time to time. And I really think that he's. Um, He's still, uh, he's still one of the best uh, teachers in this area, one of the best writers in this area that I know of. Yes. Actually, there is no Zen orthodoxy. Mm. They don't have a pope, so nobody can declare who's orthodox and who isn't. So the so-called Zen orthodoxy are a bunch of assholes who claim <laughs> to be the Zen orthodox. <laughs> the Northern California mm -hmm. Buddhist community under uh, Baker Roshi gave Alan the burial of a Buddhist saint, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though they knew he was an alcoholic. But they mm -hmm. said he was still a Buddhist saint in his own way. Of course, uh, Baker Roshi got thrown out himself shortly thereafter for having an affair with a married woman. Excuse me, that was Baker <laughs> Roshi. <laughs> Baker well, Roshi. Well, Baker Roshi? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, who's Aitken Roshi then? Uh, I think he's Robert Aitken. Plays Baker Roshi. And Baker Roshi went to Arizona. Okay, all right, I've got him mixed up. Thank you, thank you. I've got him mixed up, and I always get him mixed up. And in fact, for a while, uh, I don't know if those of you who were here this morning, and I was talking about that statement about um, if, if, if it turned out that all the writings of, uh, that were supposed to be, a tr you know, all the Buddhist scriptures turned out to be written by some uh, starving graduate student back in the 19th <laughs> century, they'd still be valuable. I used to go around attributing that to Robert Bly, and then I found out, no, it wasn't Robert Bly who said that. Now, I'm pretty sure it was Robert Aitken. <laughs> what about Baker? What's his first name? I forgot. He's been I think Baker he's a Roshi Robert too. for so long. <laughs> I forgot what his Christian Anyway, I, I got him. You know, we do have a tendency to get all these Roberts and Bobs mixed up. And, and so I got Robert Bly mixed up with Robert Aitken. And now I think it's Robert Aitken who made the statement about uh, Buddhist scriptures, fake Buddhist scriptures being okay. But I also think it's Robert Aitken who got involved with his, with his parishioners' wives. No, that was Baker. And was driven out of the. That was Baker because I, I, I okay. remember a long conversation. Okay. Well, Bob I'm going to have to get this all sorted out when I go yeah. back home, and, and maybe I can I can find in my files or whatever I can mm -hmm. find the right the, attribute the right things to the right people. Hawking. Right, the guy who does the gardening catalog, isn't he the guy who was responsible for, or isn't he the guy whose wife That's was Hawken. having? Yeah, Paul Hawken. Paul Hawken. Yeah, yeah. I think he's the guy who was respond, who was in that community and who drove uh, Baker out. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I yeah. don't know who he was because Baker. I just heard Baker's side of it. Uh huh. He, he said the husband uh, had a lot of bad karma to burn off. Uh, he tried to get rid of it by writing poison pathologies about Heathrow Resent Center in the United States. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> well, there was a period back in the uh, back in the late '80s, I think, when a lot of Zen centers were hit with scandals. It wasn't just that one, yeah. but there were there were other Zen centers around the country. And uh, my own, ult ultimately, I sort of wound up. I, I don't consider myself a plea, you know, I don't consider myself in any way an authority on Zen or even a mem I'm not even a member of any any or, uh, organized Zen group. I mean, it's just like I I take what I like from from their philosophy and that's and and that's it, you know. I'm, uh after you've been a Catholic, you get kind of leery. <laughs> and I I use the word <laughs> I use the word intentionally. Right. <laughs> You get kind of uh, you get kind of leery about committing yourself to any kind of organization or any any uh, authority. Right. Well, you either do that or you go in the other direction and you look for another church to join. And and in, in my case, I have been sort of frightened. I've been thoroughly frightened by churches. And I I uh, right right now I'm very much involved with Al-Anon, and um, I really like them. One of the things I like about them is they're they're a pretty undog uh, undogmatic bunch of people. Um, my, uh, I mentioned this because, well, uh, I, I should, I don't know if you all know what Al-Anon is. I mean, it's a, for the, if anyone doesn't, it's a spin-off of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a 12-step organization. It's, a, it's based on the 12 steps, and it is uh, for people who are somehow involved with an alcoholic. And I have my alcoholic's permission to state publicly that I'm an Al-Anon because the anonymity in Al-Anon is there to protect the alcoholics. See, if somebody says they're an Al-Anon, then right away, well, you know that somebody in their family must be an alcoholic. So normally you don't go out, come out and say you're, you're, you're an Al-Anon. But uh, uh, it is a very, um, it, they, they, have, they speak of a higher power, but there's absolutely no, the higher power can be anything. Uh, I've heard at one Al-Anon meeting, I heard a person talk about, uh, a, a woman said that her higher power, I live uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan, and this woman said her higher power was Lake Michigan. When she, uh, and I think in, you know, in this circle, uh, nobody's going to look askance at that. Um, when she needs uh, advice, or uh, she needs guidance, or she needs to get strength, she goes and confers with Lake Michigan. I guess if, if anything, after my 1960s uh, deconversion, the debriefing from, from Catholicism, if anything, I kind of turned to the Church of the Church of Fundamentalist Materialism at that point. I decided I couldn't believe in anything supernatural or I couldn't believe in anything that was um, not, uh, if I couldn't touch it. Uh, I decided that, you know, the whole thing, the Catholics are taught that, that uh, St. Thomas, the original saint, the, the apostle, they were always taught that he was kind of a flawed person because he wouldn't believe that Jesus was resurrected right. until uh, he actually met him and you know, checked out the wounds and said, "Yeah, I guess this is you, all right." You know, and I always thought, "Yeah, that's that's the way I feel about these things." When I was a little kid, I this is I swear to God, this is true. <laughs> I started disbelieving in the non-existence of God. No, I didn't. No, I started doubting the existence of God, which really terrified me because I knew that that meant I would go to hell. Uh, and I started actually tossing coins and saying, you know, if there's a God, make it come up heads. You know? <laughs> oh, well, best two out of three. <laughs> you know? And I actually remember doing that as an experiment one time when I was about eight or nine years old. And, and uh, I didn't get anywhere. Didn't, didn't learn anything. and didn't, didn't come to any conclusion from that. We've got so much in common, doing comic books before yeah. writing and all the yeah. other things. I, di I didn't try the coin thing. I tried going where no adult could hear me. I found a part, an empty lot, and I stood there and said, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, and waited to see what would happen, and nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> uh, but that didn't cure me. I, I went back to school, and the nuns went to work on my head again, I was, I was about seven. It was only when I was 14 and out of Catholic school, I really got close. Mm. But I remember trying that experiment, really scared that lightning would come down, but I just wanted to see if it would work, and it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to a Catholic grammar school, a Catholic high school run by the Christian Brothers, and a Catholic college run by, also by the Christian Brothers. 
and uh, like a lot of people, a lot of people send their kids to Catholic schools uh, because you get a good education. Um, and uh, uh, I think I got a, I really did get a terrific education, particularly at Manhattan College. They had a great liberal arts program there at the time, and it was uh, unlike any. Uh, the, the, the only thing comparable to what they were doing when I went there was the liberal arts was the program at St. John's College in Annapolis and the uh, similar program that Robert Hutchins and Mortimer Adler ran at the University of Chicago for a while. But this was, this was not a great books program. It was not, uh, you know, the uh, St. John's Annapolis, you read what are considered to be the great books and when you get out the other end, uh, supposedly you have subsumed all of the knowledge of Western civilization, um, <clears throat> which from our point of view today seems like a kind of a naive operation, but uh, it's, it's, it's not a bad program in the sense that you do read a book, and the book is probably a pretty important book, and you do really chew over it, discuss it, and get to know it pretty well, and uh, you know, that can't hurt. Uh, the, the program that we had at Manhattan College was uh, was a, what they called an integrated liberal arts program. So that there were very few, there were no electives in freshman and sophomore year, and you studied everything in chronological order. So that at the same time that you were studying in your history course, you were studying ancient history. In your philosophy course, you would be studying the pre-Socratic philosophers and then the Greek philosophers. And you'd had a fine arts course where you were studying first ancient. Um, uh, everything was Western, and I have to say to my great, but that, that, but, but my point is that I did come out of there. I really sure I had to do a lot of work on my own after that to learn about a lot of other stuff that I didn't get to learn about in college. But it did give me a terrific uh, a framework, a structure to hang things on. You know, a sense of, um, and 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 I, and I give them a lot of credit for that. I must also give myself some credit for going to various teachers and demanding to know why we didn't study Asian history and Asian philosophy and all of those things, which I thought was equally interesting and important. Of course, the answer was, uh, the answer was we don't have time, you know. <laughs> and besides, this is your roots, you know. I mean, your, your roots have nothing to do with uh, China or Japan or whatever. And, and uh, um, you got to learn about that before you can learn about anything else. And that is not a totally unreasonable uh, position to take, but um, but uh, still, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I knew enough to at least raise the question. Um, so I, I guess uh, there there really isn't much more much more to tell about my 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 interest in, in, in Buddhism. But uh, you see, that's the thread on which I've been hanging all of this <laughs> the last 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I read uh, yeah. the 12 steps and they're very Taoist. I noticed. Uh -huh. The 12 steps are very uh, could, how, uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, about letting things be and uh, accepting, you know, yes. accepting who you are and, you know, it seems mm -hmm. to be like the Taoist is be centered. And mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, there's a, there's this whole feeling now that that, that just had, it's, it's a tricky business just how far you should go accepting things, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, ex right. surely accepting things doesn't mean being a doormat, right. uh, uh, and surely that's not what we were put into this world to do, um, but there's another sense in which maybe the accepting is, is like when the Daruma dog gets pushed over, you know, mm -hmm. he goes over very easily, <laughs> but then he bounces right back up again, maybe that's what it's all about. I know a Muslim, um, I don't know if this is really all that relevant, but anyway, I, uh, I, I read a Muslim teaching, which is that we should be passive towards God and active towards the world. And um, that's kind of a nice, a nice way to put it. So whatever God throws at you, you take, you know, but then you turn around and you do whatever it is you, you feel you, you should be doing. Um, but you're right about that, and, and I see a kind of another big influence on me going back to college with the Stoic philosophers, and they, of course, they of course teach that if you really want to be happy, you should want what you got. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> and, of course. <laughs> part. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And that's again the uh, the, the idea of acceptance. Um, and you definitely do find that in, in the same thing in Buddhist teachings. And I feel uh, a, a great kinship. Uh, and in fact, 
some people have said there's some anthropological evidence that there's a connection that, uh, between Buddhist ideas and stoical ideas. One, I don't know which which fertilized which, but that, that uh, do you know anything about that? Uh, well, I, well, I know one thing. Joseph Nieder, his book Science and Civilization in China, mm -hmm. mentions there was a Buddhist monk in Athens around the time of Plato. Mm -hmm. And there was another Buddhist monk arrived in Rome at the time of Marcus Aurelius. Hmm. Yeah. So there were contacts, at mm -hmm. least two. Yeah, and it wouldn't take much, uh, really. Uh, it just takes a few people to transmit an idea from one place to another. Oh, and then there was Apollonius of Tiana, who went all over the Mediterranean teaching. He spent a couple of years in India mm -hmm. studying there. Mm -hmm. Was he a Stoic? No, but he well, he brought back uh, oh, ideas from India. Oh, but he brought back India ideas from there. Yeah, okay. to the Mediterranean world. Right, right. Uh, the thing that always attracted me to Zen, I think, is that it's. Uh, it, it, I guess it is. It's very transportability. It's such, and like Stoicism, it's kind of a no frills philosophy. You don't have to. There isn't a whole lot of. There isn't a whole lot of baggage or gingerbread with it. You know, there isn't a whole lot of stuff you have to believe. Uh, and uh, and that's good because you know I still do have this very strong uh, skeptical streak in me. And and uh, you know you can be a skeptic and confront Zen, and there's very little you can be skeptical about. You know, there's very little in it that you know, that a, that a, that a hard-headed skeptic can attack. Um, Arthur Kessler tried. Yeah, Arthur <laughs> Kessler, he is a funny man. Um, he was a funny man. It was one of the, probably one of the most, uh, one, one, really one of the most intelligent uh, and, and, and well-educated, well-informed uh, people in the Western world in his time, and a wonderful writer, and so wrong-headed. Uh, well, Bob Wilson has ta told me the story, that's where I learned that, that, that Kessler, when he, uh, I guess he was in his Marxist period, and he went to Russia to see how the great new society was working out after the Bolshevik Revolution. He spent the entire time washing his hands over and over and over <laughs> again. And he is also said to be the only person who had a bad trip with Timothy Leary. <laughs> with Timothy Leary as his guide, right? <laughs> And I mean, this man was really whatever the problems of uh, Western, whatever problems in one's thinking Western philosophy creates. He was sort of the archetype of these problems. Uh, <laughs> he wrote a book called *The Lotus and the Robot*, which was supposed to, I think, it came out around. Well, it came out around the time that uh, when, there have been so many waves of of. Asian philosophy coming to the West and people being influenced by it. I mean, you could go back to, back to Voltaire's day, and they were beginning to take an interest in in, 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 in Asian ideas. But uh, I guess this was the 50s. Uh, there was a wave of popularity, of popularization of Asian ideas that was coming in, of Hind both Hinduism and and uh, Buddhism. And Kessler went to Jap Kessler went to India and he went to Japan and it's pretty clear he, he went there just the way the amazing Randy goes someplace to prove that some paranormal <laughs> phenomenon is, is a fake, you know. Kessler went to, to India and Japan to prove that all this all this uh, attractiveness of, uh, a, of of Hinduism and, and and Buddhism was was ridiculous and these people have nothing to teach us in the West and we really are way ahead of them and we should forget this stuff. And my f two favorite things are his 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 uh, description of the rock uh, of the rock garden at uh, Rianji Temple with the you know that's that the, the big expanse of of white pebbles with the big black rocks in it, and all he could talk about was the fact that there was a loudspeaker in the background. Uh, saying things in Japanese about what a beautiful garden this was. <laughs> and as far as he was concerned, that and the fact that it was nothing but a bunch of rocks and pebbles pretty much <laughs> proved that if you know people thought this was sublime, then there was clearly something wrong with them. <laughs> and the other thing was he you know he looked into this whole business about Zen archery and he said, yes, this is a much touted idea, you know, he said, but if you actually look at the record of the Japanese archery team at the Olympics, in such and such a year, you'll find that they did very poorly. 
And so, so you know, so much for Zen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which completely misses 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 the target. <laughs> um, but it, it was really fascinating. I read, yeah, I read and reread Arthur Kessler's book, and uh, as I say, I, I, he was a person who had a lot of very, very interesting ideas on his own, and, and was not to be dismissed lightly. But um, but he sure had all of the he sure had all of the Western hangups. Um, so what I've been doing, I I, I, I have been. I, around 1974, I guess I decided to really start. I, I said this stuff. Up until now, my interest in Buddhism has been entirely academic and intellectual. I have read a lot about it. I've talked. <coughs> I've talked to people about it, uh, and I've learned uh, as much as I can. I, I, not as much as I can, but as much as I need to know. And I've really got to start. I mean, if this stuff is going to mean anything at all, I've got to start practicing it somehow. And so I read some more books. Uh, oh, I should tell you. Uh, I am probably, talk about books, I'm probably one of the people who, who is more influenced by books than, well, I'm more influenced by books than anybody I know. I get all, all of my ideas out of books. I learned about sex from a book. Um, when I was about 12 years old, my mother decided, on, and I should say that my father died when I was one, and I was raised entirely by my mother, who was a saint. <laughs> And I mean, I really believe that that she, the stuff that she put up with uh, was it was incredible. But she decided that I and and, and this is I mean this is an example of, of of what a good person she was. She didn't just leave my sex education to uh, to chance, but she got a book and she started reading to me from this book. The only thing was she had her own notion of the pace at which I should learn. And I remember the I, I looked over her shoulder at one point and I said, ah, what's masturbation? And she started laughing and closed the book. <laughs> so uh, I think about a month later, I found out where she kept it hidden. And, <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> Uh, so all my life, I mean, when I ever, ever I have wanted to learn about anything, I, I, I read a book when I was a little later and I started older and I started dating. I read a book on the art of kissing, and you know, <laughs> before I attempted to kiss anybody, I thought I should read a book on it. And um, so later, uh, so uh, I, I read some books on uh, on meditation. And that was how I learned. I learned uh, the art of Zen meditation, and I started. I started practicing it in uh, regular on a regular basis in 1974. Uh, and I think one of the books at that time that was pretty influential for me was Philip Kaplow's Three, Three Pillars of Zen. And uh, then, not long after that, I discovered I I've been living since 1974. I've been living in Glencoe, which is a little suburb of Illinois, of, of Chicago, on on Lake Michigan. It's about uh, five suburbs up from the city, and um, in Evanston, which is directly north of the city, there is a Zen center of Chicago, and I found out about them because I was just wandering around beautiful downtown Glencoe, which consists of like one block of shops. And there was a sign in the shop window saying that Roshi Philip Kaplow would be giving a workshop at the Zen Center. And so I went down there, and um, then I started I started going to this center regularly. And so my direct, actual direct contact with Zen people has been through this Zen Center of Chicago, which is connected with the one in, in Rochester, New York, which was founded by... Philip Kaplow, who's kind of, who's a really interesting guy. I've, 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 I've spoken to him about, I've exchanged about two sentences with him. You know, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he wrote his last book. He's in, he's living in retirement in New Mexico now, and he founded like this whole kind of series of Zen communities around the country, and they seem to be doing pretty well. And they're not, they're not. It's not a heavy trip. Uh, it's a place where you can go and you can meditate, and they have a beautiful zendo or room to to sit in, and nobody kind of drags you in and makes you believe stuff or makes you agree to anything. And and uh, um, it's 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 kind of a good for me. It's a kind of a good organization to be on the fringes of. 
and, and you know maybe I'll get a little bit closer into the center, but I'm, I'm still kind of in that state of of uh, once once bit twice shy. And, and, and if, if I join it, I still feel like I'm signing my life away. Um, so uh, I go there. Uh, Philip Kaplow's last book is called The Wheel of Life and Death, and it's it's actually mostly about the death part of the wheel. And um, I um, bought a copy of it from him the last time he was at the Zen Center. And um, the inscription is, for Bob Shea, may you live a long time and have a happy death. Full of pet love. <laughs> I showed that to my son, and he said, oh, God, that's creepy. <laughs> but I, I didn't think so. I thought that was, I thought that was very good. I like that. Um, so that's what I'm, what I'm currently doing is meditating. Um, I learned, gee, I learned masturbating and meditating, both from books. Uh, <laughs> that's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the one who becomes completely self-sufficient. <laughs> yeah, so I learned, uh, so uh, I've been meditating at home. Uh, uh, pretty much, and going to the Zen Center from time to time, and kind of getting my getting my contact with real live Zen people from that, and it's been uh, it's been very good. And I guess uh, the rest of my life philosophically has been uh, involved with anarchism and libertarianism, which uh, that sort of started off in 1968. I, mean, I was kind of looking again. I was uh, well. Like a lot of people, I, I was a big, big, uh, as I said, I buy into everything uh, very deeply. And um, I was a big, big partisan of John F. Kennedy at the time that he was, uh, when he was running, I was actually uh, pass, out passing out leaflets and, and, uh, and buttons and stuff like that and taking abuse from Republicans on the streets of New York City in the, in the fall of 1960. And, and uh, I really thought that uh, the, the, the new the new age had come. You know, when I when I saw his inaugural, I remember seeing as I was in a in a bar watching that inaugural address and listening to it, and I loved every word a word of it. You know, including ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. You know, which is the thing that anarchists and libertarians always hate about Kennedy, and they always point to that particular statement as showing what an authoritarian fascist statist he was <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway uh, when, okay when he was killed and when 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 then then subsequently when Martin Luther King was killed and when Bobby Kennedy was killed uh, I mean I didn't say oh this means the American political system sucks I mean it just seemed to me we had an awful lot of assassins running around m mucking things up uh, but then after that when I saw what happened by this time I had I had pretty much decided that the Vietnam War was as bad in its way as what was going on in Germany under Hitler and uh, in just as we all kind of felt that Germans had some kind of an obligation to try to do something about what was happening there, well we certainly had an even bigger obligation to try to deal with what the United States was doing in Vietnam uh, because we had the freedom to protest and uh, we weren't going to be whisked off the street by secret police if we raised our voices. So therefore, it was, uh, it was uh, even more incumbent on us to do something. So when uh, 68 came along and the Democratic Convention came along, um, we were, uh, I, I have to say, I wasn't all that militant. I mean, uh, I, I, I ran away from, I, you know, I'd, go to, I'd, I'd kind of be in a demonstration until I saw this tear gas starting to come and then I'd be gone. And uh, I remember um, the Bob Wilson and I were in a, in a couple of those, and I think I, I have to say to your credit, you stayed out in the streets a lot longer than I did. Well, I didn't stay where the tear gas was. I just <laughs> ran to some place where the tear gas wasn't. Yeah. And regrouped. Well, I ran home. <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> uh, really, I, I had to remember having a real Marshall McLuhan experience. Um, then, uh, the, the, well, you know, there was one particular night, I think it was a Wednesday night, that the real atrocities, the biggest atrocities against the demonstrators took place. That was the night that they were all kind of around the Conrad Hilton Hotel, uh, which is across the street from Grant Park, and the police just kind of descended on all these people 
and you know, I mean in masses of police. I didn't even know Chicago had that many in the trucks and everything, and they just beat the hell out of them with clubs and threw them into the trucks. And, and I, I was home watching this on TV. And that was, I, and, and, and I guess that was the night that Humphrey was nominated. Yeah. And I'm watching the going back and forth from these people being beaten up to this con to the convention hall, and you're seeing Ribikov get up to protest. You're seeing reporters being actually being manhandled off off the uh, off the convention floor. And that was when I lost my faith in the American <coughs> political system. I know it was that night watching those events. And I got to say, this is kind of like when I lost my faith in Catholicism. It isn't totally logical. I mean, you could make an argument that the American political system is strong enough and good enough to overcome these these things. Uh, but at the time, I just felt this. Yes, this really sucks. We have to. There has got to be a better way. I was down and there running away. <laughs> they never. They never did succeed in clubbing me. I, I'd run and uh, then start another group and move back slowly. And we were chanting, the whole world is watching, the yeah. whole world is yeah. watching. Yeah. And the goddamn weather people were chanting, pigs eat shit. Yeah. So every time they got near us, the TV people were turning off the sound. And that, I, mm -hmm. that was the beginning of my dislike for the weather people. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I remember distinctly that the whole world is watching came over loud and clear <laughs> on my TV set. And it gave me goose pimples. You know, I really, I, it, it, it <laughs> so, and I didn't hear pigs eat shit, so. <laughs> well, of course you couldn't, you know. <laughs> Flip, flip, flip. Right, flip, right, flip, 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 pigs eat shit, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the next night, all of the respectable people of Chicago came out to demonstrate. Everybody had been so grossed out by what they saw on their TV sets. I, I exaggerate, but a lot of people who up until that point had not wanted to participate in demonstrations, came out the next night and all gathered in Grant Park across the street from the Conrad Hilton. And I, I was working for Playboy magazine at the time. And um, a bunch of us from the Playboy office went down there after work at 5 o'clock. And uh, uh, most of us, well, you were all kind of on the younger side. A lot of women were there. And I remember there was one woman, and, a statuesque young uh, researcher by the name of Inga Hilton. And Inga went up to a soldier who had a big canister on his back and a hose in his hand. Oh, the, I should say that the entire, all, of Lake, all of Michigan Avenue was just lined with troops. And they had jeeps, and the jeeps had barbed wire on the, on the, on the front. And uh, it was pretty uh, interesting. And <laughs> Inga went up to this guy and she said, what have you got in the canister? <laughs> And he said, you'll find out. <laughs> and we were addressed, in turn, by Dick Gregory. Uh, oh, no, first we were addressed by Pierre Salinger, who, was, uh, who, was, you know, who had been President Kennedy's secretary, who was a delegate. And he kind of came up, he kind of came over to say, no, boys and girls, the system still works. Believe in the <laughs> system. And then, uh, I know it's hard, but, but try. And then Jean Genet was there. And uh, Dick Gregory was there. Dick Greg and and uh, by this time everybody said, what we have to do is actually march on the convention hall. We have to all get down to where they're having the. Uh, by this time it was. I mean the nominations had, had had gone on and everything, but it was still that would be the symbolic thing to do. So Dick. So uh, I guess some National Guard general or somebody got wind of this and sent word that if you try it, we'll stop you. Uh, because everybody knew that that was what would happen. And then Dick Gregory got up and he said, well, I ha it happens that I live on 18th Street, which is down that direction. And, well, maybe we can't march to the, uh, to the amphitheater, but uh, you can, I'm inviting all of you to visit me at my house. And it's down the same way. So then Jean Genet got up and said something in French. And, and uh, his translator was with him, and he said, Monsieur Genet says, a black man has asked me to go south with him. How can I refuse? <laughs> so, so that was it, and we all started walking. And on the on a street corner was, um, oh, Christ, what's his name? The, not Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, right? We walked past Abby Hoffman, and he's standing there, and I don't know why, this is one of those little splinter things, you know, they were, we were always disagreeing with each other about what the proper <laughs> tactics were, 
and Abby Hoffman's standing there saying, don't do it, you're all a bunch of sheep. You know, and I don't know why he didn't want us to do it, but anyway, he, you know, we're getting abuse not from the National Guard, but from Abby Hoffman. <laughs> so we went on, we went on, we got as far as 18th Street, and there were all of the troops and trucks and cops and buses and lorries and everything else all lined up. And were you there? Uh, yeah, but I did. Uh, they, they only let uh, the march get started, then they stopped for the rest of us. Oh. So I was back there in the group they wouldn't let even get started. Oh, okay. So we got as far as, and then they said, then big voices come over bullhorns. And our, uh, this, these were our people, they, we had bullhorns, or our people had bullhorns, our leaders, right? And, <laughs> and they said, uh, it has been arranged, we can't, we can't proceed any further, but it has been arranged and anyone who would like to be arrested can come to this, uh, this side of the street and go through, with, they, there'll be barricades, but there'll be one opening and you can step through the barricade and you will be arrested and you'll be taken in. So anybody who wants to be arrested, just come over here. You know, it was like, the whole thing was, it was a cachet, it was, it was a thing to brag about. You know, I remember, uh, I guess his name was Larry Li Lawrence Lipton, right, was a journalist, yeah. uh, an underground journalist at the time. He came into the Playboy office a couple of days earlier, and he said, I got hit by a cop! I got hit by a cop! And he wasn't complaining! <laughs> you know, it was like, oh God, I got my, you know, I paid my dues, I got, I got my, my medal. And there was a lot of feeling like that. So this whole idea was, if you, if you want to be arrested, then, you know, later on you can say, yes, I was at the Democratic Convention uprising, and I was arrested, you know. So I was kind of debating with myself whether I should get arrested or not, and I remember that I remembered that, that this is really stupid and paranoid, and maybe I just didn't want to get arrested, but my reasoning was I have a, I have a, a small bag of marijuana in my apartment, <laughs> and if they arrest me and they get my address, maybe while I'm still in jail they'll go over to my apartment and search it and they'll find the marijuana and I'll, you know, spend the next five years in jail. So. Okay, well, I won't get arrested. So I stayed where I, stayed where I was with the, other, with the rest of the Playboy contingent. And then I noticed a lot of young, young people, and by, I was in my 30s at this time, and by young people I mean people in their teens and 20s, uh, all wearing plastic helmet liners. And they were starting to, to they had canteens and they had, had linen handkerchiefs and they were taking the canteens and pouring water on the linen handkerchiefs and then putting this over their face. And these, they were behind me. And I said, I think I know what's about to happen here. <laughs> these people are going to rush the barricades and then there's going to be tear gas and we're all going to get either get the shit beat out of us or we're going to get gassed. So I turned to the other people I was with and I said, what do you, th what, what, what would you say we go have dinner now? <laughs> so, I know a really nice, I know a really nice restaurant and it's only about five blocks up that way. So that was Johnny's Steakhouse um, and uh, on Rush Street. Uh, and so uh, we all kind of decided that was, that was the thing to do at that time. We went up to Johnny's Steakhouse, we sat down to have dinner and there's a big TV set up over the bar, and there on the screen I watched all of the people where we had just been a short time earlier being beaten and gassed, <laughs> and it was a really, it was a weird experience. Um, it was, the only thing that I can remember that was like it was, was uh, uh, about, um, I think it was in October, Okay, that was, 19, that was August of 1968. I guess it was, yes, October of 1968, the weather people came back to Chicago, and they had a, they had a demonstration, uh, a so-called demonstration. Actually, what they did was uh, they just ran through the Gold Coast area of Chicago, which is where most of the affluent people live, smashing the windows of people's cars, and throwing uh, rocks at uh, throwing rocks at hotel most of all, all the hotels around and throwing rocks at hotel windows and generally you know proving that they were to be taken seriously that their cause was just and that um, that uh, they would ultimately prevail so that night I was having um, I was having dinner with my uh, I think she was by then my fiance or at least this was the woman I later married, uh, 
and um, her cousin and her cousin's boyfriend, and we were all going to have dinner at a really nice restaurant called uh, an Italian restaurant called Agostino's, which was in the Rush Street area. And we get into a we get into a cab, and we suddenly find ourselves in the middle of this weather people demonstration. They're all running around us, and they're all yelling things like "fuck you, motherfucker," you know, and they're <laughs> and sort of pronouncing it so clearly that you can see that they're really kind of well-educated people. <laughs> they're not kind of really used to using this language, but it's politically correct. So, and and. Uh, the cab driver was so smart. He took us. Chicago is uh, all the blocks of Chicago are honeycombed with alleys, so you can, you, if you know where the alleys are, you don't actually have to drive through the streets to get from one place to another. You just kind of turn into an alley. You go down that alley, then you go across the street into the next alley. He took us to this restaurant that way, and. Uh, and it, it just was so funny to me because I had seen Dr. Zhivago, and here I am, and the, here are the four of us dining in this elegant restaurant, and outside all of this, you know, kind of rioting is going on. And I remembered the scene in Dr. Zhivago where um, Rod Steiger and uh, who plays Lara in Dr. Zhivago? English act, Julie, Julie Christie. Christie. Julie Christie. Rod Steiger and Julie Christie are having dinner, and all the the uh, all the revolution, the the the, uh, the 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 people and the uh, common people in Moscow are all marching down the street under a banner, and they're singing some you know socialist revolutionary song, and all the people in the restaurant kind of shudder <laughs> because they know this is the future going down the street, and then Rod Steiger breaks the ice by saying. Hmm, perhaps after the revolution they'll sing on key. <laughs> and uh, so it was, uh, so 68 was really an exciting time. And then, and then I guess, uh, does anybody have a question? I've just been rambling on. Yeah, well, I know uh, a fellow who was probably younger than you were at the time and uh, who uh, was in Chicago in 68 and uh, was very active and uh, not long afterward, and he was, uh, he studied Mao, and he was really, really very active, and later on became a real estate man and leased um, a space in shopping malls in Chicago, uh, and uh, told me that most of the people who were involved in all the demonstrations were more of the, it turned out to be more the way he became than yeah, and the ones who ever stuck to it, and and uh, people uh, such as myself uh, felt that all these people betrayed us. Mm -hmm. People, though I wasn't demonstrating, I admired the people who were, and then found out that they were. Uh, a lot of them were doing it just for the fun of it because they were uh, happened to be uh, out of school at the time and mm -hmm. <laughs> seemed to be the place to be. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much of that demonstrating was real and how much of it was uh, just so they can get a knock in the head and wear a badge. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't... Yeah, I, I, I don't think those are necessarily the only two choices. Uh, uh, because I know that uh, most of the people I knew that, uh, uh, that I personally knew who demonstrated at all, who went out at all, went out because they thought there was some reason to, there was some justification to the demonstrating that the war in Vietnam was wrong and that the idea that the war was wrong did, was not getting any kind of a voice at the Democratic Convention. I mean, it was just not being represented. That, that, that point of view was, was very much the minority point of view in the, in the organized Democratic Party. So, uh, you know, I think that People have mixed motives. It's, it's not, you know, I, I think that, I'm, yeah, I, I can make, you know, little ironic jokes about the fact that we all kind of wanted to get hit so we could say later that we got hit. But at the same time, we, we were there out of conviction. I think that um, um, it's, like, it's like any war, you know. I suppose people, it, it is a kind of a war. And, and, and uh, you get involved, uh, you get involved for a number of different reasons. And after you're involved, sometimes you know not all of your not all of your motivations are uh, are the most creditable. None, we're, we're none of us, most of us are not saints. You know, in fact, that 
when I describe my own participation, I try to make the point that I was I, I was very ambivalent about this whole thing. You know, I didn't know if I should be there. I thought maybe I'm being a sucker. <laughs> Uh, you know, like these guys like Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman and so on, you know, it's all great for them. They're making a career out of this, you know, but here I'm risking, uh, I'm risking getting my head, and sure, I might get hit by a cop, I might get hit a little too hard, too, you know, and get brain damage or something like that. I mean, th th these were real thoughts that went through my mind at the time. So, um, so you know, I certainly wasn't in the, wasn't in the vanguard. Uh, uh, but I think I don't think you would go out there if, if you didn't have some sense that, that, that the, the, the side you were on was the right side to be on. You know, I mean, you wouldn't just do it because hey, it's fun. You know. Did you ever get the feeling you were at the wrong convention that you should have been at the Republican convention rather than? You know, <laughs> seemed to help get the wrong guy elected. Absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, that's, uh, uh, when I say you're absolutely right, I mean that, that, that those doubts, those doubts stay with me to this day. I remember the but. Uh, Bob and I um, uh, worked for a guy named Nat Lehrman at Playboy, and Nat was kind of a, a real orthodox liberal type person. Uh, and I remember him coming, you know, I think after, after Nixon got elected, you know, he came into me and said, well, thanks a lot. You know, you guys helped, <laughs> you know, the vote was very close, he said, and you guys helped, you guys helped elect Richard Nixon. He said, you could have worked for Humphrey. You know, Humphrey had a plan to end the war. I said, well, I... Sorry, so I didn't hear about it. They're tearing the wall down. Oh my God! <laughs> Let's get out of here before they do. Well, I thank you very, very much thank for you. your interest and attention. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.